Hello and welcome aboard the Gallant Says Podcast. It is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024, and the Houston Texans just pulled off another holy shit move. They signed Daniil Hunter. They traded for Joe Mixon. And to cap it all off, they just got Stephon Diggs from the Buffalo Bills. For peanuts, details of the deal. The Buffalo Bills traded four-time Pro Bowl wide receiver Stephon Diggs to the Texans for a 2025 second-round pick. It's the Vikings pick. For Diggs, a sixth-round pick this year, number 189 overall, and a fifth-round pick in 2025. I'll be honest, I did not see a move for a wide receiver coming after the Houston Texans restructured Titus Howard's contract and freed up the cap space that they did. I thought if they were going to make a move, it would be for another cornerback. I know they brought in C.J. Henderson. I know they brought in Jeff Okuda, but you shouldn't be expecting that much from those two. I thought that they maybe would be going after a safety. I think Justin Simmons is still out there. I'd prefer Quandre Diggs. I don't know if there's any defensive tackles out there that they would go after. Stephon Diggs was not someone I thought they would bring in. And I know some people are going to push back hearing that. Because you'll remember that at the very beginning of the offseason, D'Amico Ryans and Nick Casario had talked about, publicly with us, looking to get a wide receiver who could get open, which was a big problem against the Baltimore Ravens in their season-ending loss. Part of that had to do with the fact that there was no Tank Dell, but just C.J. Stroud and Nico Collins, that wasn't enough for them to make it to the AFC championship game for the first time. If you pay attention to the gambling side of things, the Texans went from plus 140 to plus 115 to win the AFC South and from 11 to one to plus 750 to win the AFC and from 22 to one to 18 to one to win the Super Bowl. I know a lot of people out there are very excited about a splashy move like this. And you should be. It's fun when your team decides, fuck it. It's been a bad the last couple of years. We just stumbled into something great with CJ Stroud. Let's see what we can do. Maybe the AFC is wide open. Clearly, the Buffalo Bills are taking a step back of their own choice. The Kansas City Chiefs, yeah, they're the defending Super Bowl champions. They're going to be going for a three-peat, but they just traded Legereus Sneed away to the Tennessee Titans. The Baltimore Ravens might have a Lamar Jackson problem in the playoffs. And all of a sudden, your team is saying, yeah, We think we can win. So we're going to go after a wide receiver that at this moment in time isn't going to cost us a whole lot. If I'm going to praise anything right now, it's Nick Casario. That was a fantastic trade. You traded for a guy that, yeah, is getting paid a pretty good amount of money. You take a look at his contract. This coming season. It's a lot more than you're going to be paying Nico Collins. I thought they might give an extension to. After they freed up that space for Titus Howard. uh, With Titus Howard's uh, rework deal. That maybe they would think about giving to somebody else. Who's not on the roster. But Diggs is going to be making $18.5 million this year. He's under contract through 2027. But the Texans. Theoretically can get out of the deal after this coming year, if things don't work out. Next three years, he'd be worth $18 million, $19.1 million, and $14.5 million for 25, 26, and 27. 
That's a lot and does make you wonder if they're actually going to be able to give Nico Collins a contract extension when his contract ends at the end of the year. He has another career season. You might be looking at Nico Collins wearing another uniform. But maybe the Texans decide, you know what? We're going to pay multiple wide receivers, whatever the case. This was a hell of a move by Nick Casario. I don't want to go so far as to compare it to when the Patriots traded for Randy Moss because Randy Moss is one of the top three receivers ever, and they only had to give up a fourth-round pick to get Randy Moss, and then Moss proceeded to break all sorts of records. Moss is the kind of freak that I'm not sure Diggs has ever been, but Diggs once was a top-five wide receiver in this league, an absolute steal in the fifth round for Minnesota, and a damn good career with both the Vikings without a quarterback like Josh Allen and then with the Bills with Josh Allen. So the deal is awesome. And this is where I'm going to piss some people off. When the move happened, my first reaction wasn't one of excitement and enthusiasm. It was, oh. Now, I didn't know the details of the trade. The details of the trade made me feel a little bit better about it. But I don't think I'm as excited as I should be about the Texans making this move. And the main reason is everything that I know about Stefan Diggs, the player, indicates that he's not the best teammate. I saw a couple of jokes online making fun of Sean McDermott and his weird pregame speeches. There's no I in Al-Qaeda. Because if you don't know, Sean McDermott supposedly once used the 9-11 hijackers as part of some sort of motivational speech for Buffalo Bills players. Remember when that story came out? And then the Bills were 6-6 six and six at the time. Looked like McDermott was about to be out of a job. They go on to win the last five games of the regular season. A playoff game before ultimately losing to the Kansas City Chiefs. That did happen. But anyway, Diggs has always been somebody that seems unhappy with his circumstances. To make a comparison... It would be a lot like Aaron Rodgers complaining about his situation in Green Bay as much as he did. Here's why. Diggs has never been on a losing team. He's been in the NFL for nine years, and with Minnesota, they were never sub-500. For the five years he was there, the Vikings had a winning record. Sure, Kirk Cousins isn't the best quarterback in the NFL. He's better than a lot. Case Keenum had a pretty good year under center with Stephon Diggs. They have the Minneapolis miracle that they'll always be able to look back at in Minnesota. That's arguably the greatest play in franchise history, that touchdown pass to win it against the New Orleans Saints. But Diggs is one of those guys who threw a lot of above-average moments in the NFL, has always seemed upset with the situation. Towards the end of his time in Minnesota, we heard that he wanted out. The last year plus in Buffalo, even though he had signed a contract extension in 2022, we also heard that he wanted out four years, $96 million. He signed an extension with Buffalo. And still, despite that deal, we heard that he wanted out and take a look at the way that the bills play down the stretch. They won all those games. As I mentioned before, did you notice Diggs' production in those games in the Last, let's go all the way back to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In the last ten games of the season, these are Diggs' stat lines. In a loss to the Denver Broncos, three catches for 34 yards. In a win over the New York Jets, four catches for 27 yards. In an overtime loss to the Eagles, six catches for 74 yards and a touchdown. This is where the Eagles' winning streak started. Four catches for 24 yards against Kansas City. They won that game. Four catches for 48 yards against Dallas. Five catches for 29 yards against the Chargers. Four catches for 26 yards against the Patriots. Seven catches for 87 in the regular season finale against the Dolphins. Seven catches for 52 yards against the Steelers in the first round of the playoffs. Three catches for 21 yards against the Chiefs, not mentioned. A drop, critical one, that he had down the right sideline that potentially could have given given Buffalo a chance 
to actually win that game. So, my biggest question about this deal right now isn't about whether or not Nick Casario won the deal. He won. And it isn't about whether or not Stephon Diggs is going to buy in playing with C.J. Stroud as his quarterback and D'Amico Ryans as his head coach in year one and work his ass off to prove all the people who are doubting him right now wrong. My biggest question is whether or not he's still got it. Because I think you could make an argument that down the stretch of this past regular season, that was not the Stephon Diggs that we all know. That was a plus wide receiver, certainly, who would look great in a receiver core that also features Nico Collins and Tank Dell. But I don't know that he's still the same guy. I have a couple of questions that I'm asking myself. We'll read some of your comments here as well, whether you're on YouTube, at Paul Gallant, on twitch.tv slash Gallant says, or on Twitter right now. Let's read a couple of comments right now. Uh, Home Sephora Lee uh, comments on X. Hi, Paul. Texans comments. Yo, Paul, appreciate your content from League City. Shout out to League City. Uh, Johnny Lambeau, the steal of the offseason Nick keeps cooking. It is a steal. They robbed the Bills blind with this deal. Now the Bills have to deal with $31 million in dead cap space. I mean, that is a shit ton of money. And it does feel, based off of reporting by my friend Tyler Dunn, Syracuse grad, in his go-long um, column, Diggs apparently didn't like Sean McDermott. The issues with Josh Allen might have been a little bit overstated. One ex-teammate on offense, per Tyler Dunn, said he knows for a fact that Diggs does not enjoy playing for McDermott. I know Diggs, and Diggs want to be able to do what he wants to do with OTAs and shit like this. Diggs is going to get his work in. The organization I'm at now understands the great players don't need you to babysit them to be great. Diggs wants to be great for Diggs. And when you question that, Diggs gets pissed off because that's testing his integrity and what he wants to be. And I definitely think that's where Sean fucks up. Talking about Sean McDermott there. So those comments are from somebody who played with Diggs. And it does feel like there are a lot of people, and this is in an article about Sean McDermott, where it felt like all the knives were out right before he eventually gets ousted as head coach of the Bills. And then, of course, they win the last five regular season games, a playoff game, totally different conversation. But I wonder if the Houston Texans are going to look at Stephon Diggs and say, well, we expect you to be a part of what we do. And there is a weird dynamic in the NFL <laughs> for those who haven't played football before where you are expected to be there at all times no matter who you are. I don't know if D'Amico Rhines is going to make exceptions, but we do know that with the Bill O'Brien Houston Texans that there were exceptions made for a couple of players. DeAndre Hopkins, Jadevi, and Clowney. Is that par for the course? In 2024, where those guys were seemingly allowed to do their own thing, didn't necessarily have to be there at every practice. Because Diggs is somebody who was, quote, excused, end quote, from mandatory minicamp by Sean McDermott, who acknowledged that there was some sort of issue going on. Diggs spoke during this past season about his commitment to the Buffalo Bills, but also had some <laughs> deep quotes that almost sound like rap lyrics. When you're drawing conclusions as to stuff I've never said, that's what kind of troubles me because it kind of throws a wrench in it, said Diggs. It kind of creates chaos where I haven't created. Chaos created around me, whereas I just been in the same space. I've been in the same place, and I've spoken true words. I've said the same thing over and over and over. So when you draw a conclusion as to how I feel in my foreseeable future here, I've never said anything, but I was a Buffalo Bill. I gave it everything I got. I'm a professional, and I treat this game as such. He said that publicly, but the way he was acting on social media didn't seem to correlate with somebody who feels good about being a member of the Bills. 
And you got to wonder if it is a situation where the honeymoon that he'll have with C.J. Stroud as his quarterback, with D'Amico Ryans as his head coach, with a team that's clearly pushing all of its chips into the middle of the table trying to win right now, you got to wonder how long that honeymoon phase is going to last. There will be a honeymoon phase. I'm sure that Diggs is going to do his best to prove to people, as I said a little bit before, that he's still got it. And he's going to be very excited about the factor, uh, possibility of playing with, one, C.J. Stroud, but two, a wide receiver core that also features Nico Collins, who I think is a very good player, Tank Dell, too, Joe Mixon in the backfield, Damian Pierce. I feel pretty good about Damian Pierce now because I don't think the teams are going to be able to load the box. That's your backup running back. You got Dalton Schultz. I mean, you got a really good offense, a ton of money invested into the offensive line. The offense on paper, it looks tremendous right now. Tremendous. The biggest reservations I have about the Diggs move have to do with the fact that I wonder what happens when Diggs, who constantly seems frustrated in his situation, gets frustrated. If Diggs had been on a bunch of shitty teams before, I would feel awesome about this and the possibility of him buying in. Like Randy Moss going from the Raiders, a shit show, to the Patriots. You're going to buy in at least for a good amount of time. But if you've been in good situations and you're coming into a situation with a lot of young players that's on the rise, are you going to buy in like those guys or are you going to expect to be treated differently? I don't think he should be treated differently just given the way we've seen him play the second half of this past season. First half of this past season, he looked pretty damn good. Second half, that's where I've got some questions. Let's read some comments here. YouTube.com slash Paul Gallant, Twitch.tv slash... Gallant says, Collectible says, Super Bowl, baby, yeah! Poor Marine says on Twitch, Paul, this would be a bad deal because the dude is a cancer. He did not have the speed or the routes. I'll be honest, I didn't watch enough of Diggs to d know whether or not he's still the same guy other than in the playoff games and some of those big games down the stretch. But if you watch that Chiefs game, would you have walked away from that game feeling like he's the same guy? I don't know. And statistically, take a look at those numbers. They don't look like the same guy, especially considering that Josh Allen, that's his favorite target, and also considering the fact they won despite Diggs not getting the football. Uh, Collectible says, you think they're going to be hard to guard this year? Who would you pick if you had to base around your defense? I'm a little confused by that question. I'm guessing who would you pick to cover first of all those guys? Lock up with your number one corner. Hmm. I'm probably throwing it at Nico Collins right now. But it is tricky because Tank Dell, like Collins, has an incredible ability to get past defenders. Diggs is the guy that is, I think, just better at creating open spaces for himself. And, and the Texans said they wanted to find a wide receiver who does that. So there you go. Uh, Rick Hagwood is suggesting, guys, that you can get in the draft. I'm sorry. I, the draft conversation, the pre-draft stuff, I'm out. I get into it when there's actually guys on the roster. Uh, Jacob Ayer says, we're about to tear up this league. Uh, Red Jello 420 says, I don't think they make the same run again with Stroud, even with Nico and Diggs. It's going to be a tougher schedule this year, that's for sure. Um... Jacob Byer says, if Diggs acts up, he's getting cut. We only have to have him for one year, so I think he's going to be on his best behavior. I agree with you there. It, it, but I wonder, do you keep him past the one year? Because if you keep him past the one year, it might be more difficult to keep Nico Collins and keep some of the other young players on your team. Uh, Dever Grant, great moves this year for the Texans. Texans answer the defense, do you think? Nice pick uh, to answering the wide receiver group. Here's the thing, and this is another tough question I'm going to ask, and I think some people are going to be pissed off at me when I ask it, but... Does acquiring a wide receiver make the Houston Texans more of a Super Bowl contender? Adding a wide receiver. You have Nico Collins. You have Tank Dell. You have to allocate your resources to all different spots on the roster, and you do not have a second cornerback. I think most people would have a hard time naming the best defensive tackle on the Houston Texans off the top of their head. They also do not have a safety that is good at covering deep downfield. And I know some people are going to say, well, you can find guys like that in the draft. And sure, you can, you might, but you might not too. 
you're going to be betting on yourself. You're going to be betting on Nick Casario. I think a lot of people have faith in Nick Casario's scouting ability right now, and you're also hoping that D'Amico Ryan is going to be able to coach up some of these young players, specifically Jeffrey Okuda and C.J. Henderson, two top 10 cornerbacks drafted during the pandemic year. But I'll ask that question again. Does a third wide receiver push you over the top, make you more of a Super Bowl contender? This is the splashiest move of the offseason thus far, which is saying something because the Houston Texans also added Daniil Hunter. They added uh, Danico Autry, 28 sacks between the two of those guys. Aziz al Shair, damn good linebacker for the Tennessee Titans. They've brought in a lot of pieces. It's not like Diggs is the only guy that they are bringing in. But do you think that Diggs is that finishing piece? Your offense looks very difficult to stop, but... On the road in Kansas City, on the road in Baltimore, when it's cold, and you got two defenses that know how to hit people, is a high-powered offense that plays the majority of its games indoors suddenly going to be better than those two teams? Or against Joe Barrow and the Bengals? You have definitely put yourself in a spot where you're going to be able to keep up in a shootout with every single team that you play against, assuming health. But, again, does a wide receiver, when you already had a good wide receiver group, I think Noah Brown was a perfectly capable number three wide receiver, does having this many wide receivers make you go from where you were literally a week ago, without Stephon Diggs, does that make the difference to get you past Kansas City, to get you past Cincy, Baltimore? I don't think it does. And I hope that they're going to find some guy in the draft that they can plug in that does a really good job. But I feel like while this move was a big splash, it's not the move that wins you a Super Bowl. And maybe this is just me looking at the Texans and thinking to myself, they've never been to an AFC championship game. When are they ever going to get to one? And also looking at the Kansas City Chiefs, who are sort of like Michael Myers. I don't know if I'm ever going to buy into the idea of another AFC team beating the Chiefs until I see the body zipped up in a bag. And even then, I'm going to keep my distance because I don't want the body to reach up with a hand and grab me by the neck and kill me. You know, like at the end of Friday the 13th when when uh, Jason blasts out of the water and almost kills that girl in her canoe. So, it's a great move. It's a steal. Is it the finishing piece? I don't know. But I know a lot of you people are probably going to say, hey, uh, this changes my expectations for the Houston Texans. I'm going to expect more out of them. In fact, I'm demanding that they make it to the AFC Championship game. Right now, you are a disappointment if you don't win the AFC South. Period. Got to win the AFC South. Have to. Can't afford to not win it with all that you have put in to this year and, of course, the years to come. This is one of the reasons I was pushing back against adding another wide receiver all offseason. I, I just don't think you need another wide receiver in the way that some people on here were pushing it. And I think fantasy football has ruined a lot of your brains, to be perfectly honest. I think a lot of you are looking at things through the prism of fantasy football. And hey, listen, I have no problem with that. A lot of people play it. It's a fun thing to play. But winning a Super Bowl is one in the trenches. I feel like still you could use some depth on your interior offensive line. Depth on the interior defensive line. You got a great pass rush, but can you stop the run? Are your linebackers going to be able to cover tight ends? Do you have a safety capable of covering anyone? Lots of questions I have. Um, what else do we have here? I think I've answered a lot of the questions here. Let's read some more. YouTube.com slash Paul Gallant. Twitch.tv slash Gallant says, I saw Jordan Alvarez, by the way, for the Astros, just hit a home run, and I think the bases were loaded, and the Astros get out of the inning, and, um, yeah, they only got one run. That's that's not surprising. 
Uh, Chris House, we already beat Joe Burrow next. Well, I mean, Joe Burrow beat Patrick Mahomes a couple of times. And then Mahomes beat him in the last AFC Championship game. They played each other. The the idea that a regular season victory over the Cincinnati Bengals means that the Texans are better than the Bengals going forward, especially when C.J. Stroud almost gave that thing away with that awful interception he threw at the very end. Huh. I don't know. Uh, Stroud for MVP is saying we play Baltimore at home, by the way. But what happens in the playoffs? Take a look at that schedule. You're telling me the Texans are going to have the number one seed when you look at that schedule and you go up against those players defensively? Those quarterbacks defensively, you know? Uh, Stroud for MVP. MVP is still pushing. Yes, we needed a wide receiver. You did not need a, another wide receiver. And he said something fucking dumb, too. What was this? Stay in your lane. Where is this comment? Sorry, I'm scrolling through it. Respectfully, bro, stay in your own lane. We needed a separator. Noah Brown is a contested catch kind of guy. What the fuck does that mean? Did you see Noah Brown separate himself by 80 yards for a fucking catch-and-run touchdown? What are you fucking talking about? Some of you people have diluted confidence in your ability to evaluate football, and I don't, but do you think Noah Brown's not a very good number three wide receiver? You have to have literally three wide, wide receiver one capable players. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, this is, this is a luxury. This was not a need. And it's okay to have luxuries, and luxuries could theoretically win you a Super Bowl someday. I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility that this is the finishing touch, but I, I just look at it right now and I say, yeah, I like it. I'm not ex doing backflips over it. I'm not super excited about the move in a way that a lot of other people are. I'm happy they made it. It's a highway robbery, but I'm not sure that Diggs is still the same guy. I wonder about Diggs buying in here long term. And I really wonder if this puts you ahead of teams in the AFC that are better than you. What happens if the interior offensive line is just getting absolutely destroyed like they were against the Baltimore Ravens? What if Chris Jones is fucking your shit up up the middle all game long? Which certainly can happen. Ah. <sighs> Twitch.tv slash Gallant says. YouTube.com slash Paul Gallant. Uh, True Texas 210 says on Twitch, I saw the video earlier where you said we had too much, but we needed a wide receiver three in case of injuries. I, I never really was co-signing it. I more looked at it as, hey, you kind of have to go into the year and hope that not everybody gets hurt. And if you are getting a third wide receiver, it's because you're admitting that you don't trust Tank Dell to make it through an entire season. So, there you go. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Strap for MVP. Yeah, you don't know anything. And that my ass. Up. I mean, oh, I see that right there. I don't want to be a dick about it. What's that? Oh, is that a Patriots towel? Because I grew up watching the Patriots, who have been to more AFC championships than I can remember? Oh, yeah, it is. I've seen more good football than you, buddy. Do I know more about football because of where my parents had sex? In this situation? Yeah, I do. When you watch Tom Brady and the Patriots growing up, you have an inner sight. Hell, I mean, you know, probably growing up watching the Patriots is why I'm such a fucking amazing flag football player. It's probably why. And I don't mind if people say I don't know ball. I know I know ball. I grew up watching the Patriots. I remember back in 2011 and 2012 when you guys were so cute in your little Letterman jackets and you guys thought that this is going to be the year that it's different. And look, things have changed for me. I definitely care more about what the Houston Texans do on a Sunday-to-Sunday -Sunday basis than I did I was growing up in Massachusetts. I barely have time to watch Patriots games anymore. And obviously they fucking suck now, but I've seen so many teams that thought that loading up on offense was going to make it happen. I thought that loading up, um, by just building the dream team was going to happen. That winning in March is the way to win a Super Bowl, And uh, uh, the Patriots will tell you that, Generally was something that they laughed at back in the day. And when you got a quarterback like C.J. Stroud, he elevates the level of play of all the players around you. So you're going to have to allocate resources to parts of the team that you actually want to improve. 
the wide receiver group was certainly good enough. Nico Collins and Tank Dell, that's a damn good one-two combination. Noah Brown's a damn good number three. You did not need Stephon Dix. You did not. Could you have drafted a guy? Sure. Did you need Stephon Dix? I don't know. Uh, Tor McJohnson says Dix is our Tyreek Hill. That's an unfair comparison because Tyreek Hill is one of the fastest players that's ever played in the game. Diggs is not that. Hill is a cheat code. And it's bullshit that the Chiefs, who look the other way in a lot of different things, um, I'm having a major brain fart all of a sudden. What the hell was I talking about? This is what happens when you're doing a show by yourself and you don't drink enough coffee. And also when you have the Astros on on the television that's right behind you. Um, yeah, I don't remember what I was saying. Classic. Um, uh, shot for MVP. Uh, said something else about uh, growing up watching the Pats. We didn't need Stefan, but we do need guys that can get open consistently. Yeah, I know, but you you have that. You have that. You have Nico Collins. You have Tank Dell. Like what? What the fuck else do you want? You know. Ugh. Chris House says, look at what the Rams did. Sure. And I mean, one of the reasons you should credit the McNair family, the Rams don't give a fuck about money. That's why they can do all that salary cap circumventing and draft pick trading that they did over those years. And it did ultimately work out for them in spite of Sean McVay's best efforts to shoot the Rams in the back of the head against the Bucks, against the 49ers, and against the Bengals in three games in a row. Sean McVay almost lost them every single one of those games, and I get it. He's a good coach, but he has put on a pedestal that I don't understand. He has photographic memory. Well, a lot of people do when you study film of football, and that's your life over and over and over again. I mean, I can remember stuff from playing high school football back in 2006. <laughs> like, that's 20 fucking years ago almost. Everyone can remember things if you study them enough. Photographic memory? Come on. He scored three points in the Super Bowl against Bill Belichick. What are we doing here? Um, Chris House, Jeff Okuda is a nice cornerback too, for real, for real. I mean, he's been on three teams since entering the league in four years. So, no, he's not, but good luck. Um, Cooper, Texas says, will cornerback ones cover Collins or Diggs? I think the real question is what's their size and what's their speed? Collins is so big, so it really depends on who's going up against him. You want a tall guy to be going up against... Nico Collins, uh, with Diggs, you're going to have to have someone quick. With Dell, you're going to have to have someone quick because Diggs in and out of breaks is really, really tough to stop. And you can watch some of the highlights of him this past year. You know, I think specifically against the Dolphins early in the year, he had some really beautiful moves on out routes and such. Um, what else do we have to dive into here? Uh, Chris House, what would you do in the draft? Best player available. I'm not the guy to come to to ask draft questions. I don't really pay attention to the college prospects. To me, I think that the amount of time that we put into studying players who might be drafted, the mock drafts we do for those players, I feel like we do too much. I think that there's a certain point where we all need to take a deep breath and chill and realize that some of these guys that we think are going to be good are going to suck, and some that we think are going to suck are going to be good. And honestly, if that's the way that this goes in the draft, then what's really the point of studying anything until we actually see these guys play in the NFL? I can grade what the Houston Texans do based off of the specific positions that they go after, but draft the best players that are available, always. You can't force drafting a player at a specific draft slot or moment in time because you have a need there. I know some teams do it and very often they end up with somebody that they don't necessarily want or passing up on somebody that would have been a really good player for them that they could have potentially had at a bargain by finding him in the second, third, fourth round or something like that. Um, NJ Fuentes, Respector, I love draft shit. You're crazy. Draft shit is so fucking dumb. Everyone thinks they're an expert on it now. I think back in the day when it was a couple of people that were weighing in on it and you watch college football, fine. But now everyone thinks they're a fucking draft expert. And I'm sorry, who has a 
plus 50% hit rate in the draft. General managers don't even have that. So why the fuck should I listen to anybody who's studying and putting all this time into it? Even if you actually do know what to look for and what you're studying, ultimately, are you going to be right? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, all right. I want to talk about another mercurial wide receiver who's dealing with actual off the field shit. Yeah! How about we talk about a guy by the name of Rashi Rice? Every now and then, I see stories that involve athletes getting in trouble off the field. And it bums me out because it reminds me that if you have a certain amount of money, you can get away with a lot. People are going to look the other way for a lot. And that's what we had up in Dallas with former SMU wide receiver and Super Bowl champion wide receiver, Rasheed Rice, the 55th overall pick in this past year's draft. Really good rookie year. 79 catches for 980, uh, 938 yards and seven touchdowns in the regular season. 26 catches for 262 and a touchdown in the postseason. That was a hell of a find by Kansas City. But he's in hot water for something that he did on the Dallas Roads. You know what I'm talking about? Well, perhaps we should show the class what went down. And if you take a look here, youtube.com slash Paul Gallant, twitch.tv slash Gallant says, I am going to show you some dash cam footage. As you can see, people driving along. Take a look at the left right now. Holy shit, where the fuck did those two cars come from? What do we have here? On the left and on the right, we have two cars that have just absolutely destroyed this poor hatchback, and oh no, things are about to get worse. It's a van. <laughs> the van's in the middle of the road. And both of these cars have spun out. As we get closer to the car, we can see that one of these cars is a Lamborghini SUV. The other one is a Chevrolet Corvette. Get a little bit closer to the car here. You'll notice on the passenger side, there's one person getting out of the car. There's two people getting out of the passenger side of the car and a third person getting out of the back seat. And they're all walking over to the right. Hmm. Now, if you take a look at the write-up of the incident that Rishi Rice was involved in, that Lamborghini SUV was being leased from a place called the classic lifestyle for 1750 a day the car is worth about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. it was totaled the chevrolet corvette is owned by rishi rice so they're doing a little street racing in some super powered cars there's a story today an update Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver Rasheed Rice said via social media that he met with Dallas police today and takes full responsibility for his part in the crash that injured four people Saturday. Isn't it crazy that a crash that, in case you didn't see it one more time, a crash that looked like this resulted in just four injuries? I mean, this poor car in the passing lane has no idea that, boom, Lamborghini's going to go to the left. 
and then the Corvette's going to hit it from the right. So it gets hit by two cars at the same time. I don't know what that Lamborghini thought was going to happen. I suppose that guy getting into the passer lane maybe should have taken a look behind him to see what happened. But these cars are fucking flying like it's the fast and goddamn furious. So everything spins out. And then this van gets hit. And another car gets hit. It spins out. I mean, we're talking six cars in a pileup here. And somehow, some way, we're only talking about four injuries. So let's get into something else. I'm going to put the headphones on for this. So I saw a video of what happened after this accident. And the first video I'm going to show is one that was posted to uh, Twitter. And this video features some commentary from people that were recording this probably because they wanted to get everybody's information and they were a part of the crash. So uh, let's watch it. A man films the aftermath of this six car pileup in Dallas. You guys all right? Yeah. We gotta get in here, bro. You guys just gonna leave it? So in case you j didn't hear that, the person who's recording says, are you guys all right? You don't hear a response. After that, he says, you guys are just going to leave it. You're not supposed to leave the scene of an accident, especially when people get hurt at it. Per Texas legal code, the person operating the vehicle is required to immediately stop at or return to the scene of the accident when the accident could result in injury. If you saw the replay of everybody getting out of that one car, you'll notice that two people got out on the passenger side of the front of that car before going around to the breakdown lane and walking away from the accident. Dumb, right? <laughs> Let's just start and end with that was fucking dumb. He should have stayed. People were going to find out who that Lamborghini was leased to. It's under his name. People were going to find out who owned that Chevy Corvette because he actually fucking owned it. But everyone left, both cars, they walk away, and this video continues. And this is how somehow, some way, the video stops being about Chiefs wide receiver Rasheed Rice, who I imagine will get a slap on the wrist from the city of Dallas, a slap on the wrist from the Chiefs maybe, maybe a slap on the wrist from the NFL, and a situation that could have killed people. Here is what somehow and some way became the focus of this accident. They just left the, they left the fucking Lamborghini and a Corvette. They stole them, I bet. They stole them, I bet. Did he really just say that? Wait, let's play that one more time. Corvette, they stole them, I bet. <gasps> they were putting firearms under They were putting firearms under there? Oh, shit. Well, that, now that, that's really getting real. If all of a sudden we're talking about guns here, too. Now, I didn't actually see any guns. And this video that we're showing, it just shows a couple of people that are walking in the breakdown lane and stuff. But... This is the second time that I've seen this video. The first time I saw it was on Instagram. And Instagram breeds the dumbest people. And of course, a video like we just saw is going to become an issue. But not because of two people playing Fast and Furious. It's going to become an issue because of some people who in this spot made the thing about race. And remember, <laughs> this was the fucking accident via dash cam. In case you missed it, bottom left, boom! 
These people were driving like maniacs. And I suppose Instagram, which is an absolute fucking festering shithole addiction machine of an app. I suppose that the people that saw this video, they didn't see the actual accident that took place. And the people walking away from the scene of the accident, they don't know how serious this accident is. But clearly it's in the middle of the highway. Probably not a good one. I went through the comment section on Instagram and I lost some brain cells along the way. This was a fucking bad job by me, but it breeds the dumbest fucking people. First comment I saw, what happened to innocent until proven guilty? Referring to the commentary that we heard there. Uh, sir, what, what happened to eyeballs? Innocent until proven guilty. I, I think everybody's eyes saw these two cars flying on the fucking highway. <laughs> causing six cars to spin out. <laughs> They're definitely guilty of causing the accident. And you would think that people walking away from super expensive cars that just got in an accident maybe did not actually own those cars, seeing as they seem to care so little about their property. It's just a thought. Wouldn't it go through your head? Whether they're white, black, Asian. Isn't that something that we'd all think? If a bunch of people are walking away from an accident with super expensive cars and they're just leaving them there, don't you think that some people would have some ideas as to why they got left there? You're talking with somebody to you next to you. It's pretty suspicious to see all those guys walking away, regardless of race. But I know race is always at the forefront. So I read some more comments, and these comments almost all center around that person recording the video saying, they bet they stole them. Quote from the comment section of Instagram. They stole them. I bet is crazy. They stole him. That got to be racist. They stole them. I bet is crazy. Whole time, he don't even know he's an NFL player. Not acting like an NFL player. Certainly not acting like one. <laughs> Playing fast and furious. More so, you're acting like the University of Georgia Bulldogs football team with all the speeding violations that they got before the ultimate tragedy that saw Jalen Carter's draft stock in jeopardy before last year's draft. Some more comments. Turning this thing into race. The colonizers always accusing somebody of stealing, even though they stole people from Africa and stole the land in America. Oh, fuck, dude. Come on. Can we stay on the topic at hand? They're walking away from the scene of an accident. Uh, another comment. They stole them, I bet. Sounds like a poor white man being jealous of a black man. Like, black man can't be successful. L uh, shaking my head. Well, they're not successful drivers. They're not successful drivers. That's for fucking sure. Um... Uh, another comment, of course, the white dude thinks the black men stole the luxury car. <sighs> like, why does it have to be about race? Why, why can't we just say, like, these guys were driving like maniacs and they shouldn't have left the scene of the accident? <laughs> can't can it just be that? Do we need to show both videos for everyone to feel that way? At least some people thought that the six-car pileup and walking away from the accident was bad, said one person. Dumb decision, leaving the scene. But the racist comment is even worse. What if someone had died? Would the racist comment still be worse? Situation bad. Commentary even worse. Another person. And then we have some other people that are like, why would you even post this? But not because of, you know, the whole, like, hey, they're walking away from the scene of the accident. Why would you post this with this commentary? One comment. Why would the cameraman release this video? Another comment. The audacity to say that and still post it on the internet. Laughing my ass off. I mean, they walked away from a luxury car. It's like a Lambo and a fucking Corvette. What are you doing? More comments. This is why people who live to record shit go and start to get hurt. So now we're threatening this guy? Because he said in a passing comment to a bunch of, about a bunch of people walking away from the scene of an accident involving luxury cars. Um, they must have stolen it. The last comment I saw. You ever need tips on how to get unalive to talk to the guy filming? Laughing emoji. Jesus Christ, we're threatening the guy now? He's got to send that to his insurance at least. Maybe don't post it online, I suppose. But, I mean, I can totally understand why somebody's first thought would be that that was stolen. White, black, Asian, it doesn't matter. Rasheed Rice acted like an idiot here. And fortunately for Rasheed Rice, he is an NFL player. He has... 
a contract that a second round draft pick would get. I'm looking this up off the top of my head. I don't know the details. Rasheed Rice has a four-year, $6.4 million rookie deal. He is going to be able to get the best legal representation he possibly can. Hell, the Chiefs are probably going to help him out with that. And the Chiefs looked the other way on a lot of shit. I don't know. Tyreek Hill. Frank Clark. Among others. Chiefs looked the other way a lot as an organization. Win by any means necessary. <laughs> Win in the court of law. Get yourself a Johnny Cochran. Put that guy in there. Pay a little extra money. Rasheed Rice gets a slap on the wrist. Hey, he apologized at least. He figured out after the fact that what he did was really fucking wrong. Luckily, no one was hurt. But in this country, we focus on race for stupid shit like this when we should be focusing on the fact that if you have money, you live under separate rules. And that is a shame. I want to read some comments because I know people came here mostly, mostly for me talking about Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans. I'm not going to read all these comments because guess what? Things got a little feral. Chris House, thank you for the donation. Baltimore against Texans before season's prediction. Are you, do you mean, do you think that's going to be the AFC championship game? I'm curious. I'm very, very curious curious i feel like kansas city that's gonna be the team that the texans are gonna have to go through to make it through and at the very least they will get a regular season trial run before a hopeful playoff rematch but look ultimately i think you should be very happy about the houston texans trade for stefan Diggs. i don't know that it puts them over the top in the afc but they are certainly better. How much better? I don't know. I don't think a third wide receiver is going to be the difference. I hope that they find themselves a better deep coverage safety. I hope that they find a better defensive tackle. I hope that they find a better second cornerback. They're better, but is an explosive offense that now adds Stephon Diggs, who we're not sure is still the same player. Is that enough? The Texans clearly think so. We'll see how this all plays out. I am definitely excited for this year. This is the most excited I think this city has ever been for the Houston Texans going into a season with C.J. Stroud, with the offseason moves, with D'Amico Ryans, with the new uniforms, everything is pretty damn cool right now. So apologies if there's a little bit too much negativity in this show. I appreciate y'all stopping by. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this on YouTube. Like the video, youtube.com slash Paul Gallant, or on twitch.tv slash Gallant says, subscribe if you like it. You're more of a Twitch person. Also on Twitter, at Gallant Says. This is available in podcast form. I'm going to post it a little bit later so you can listen to it. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on whatever. I guess I guess Google Podcasts is now just straight YouTube. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for stopping by. So long, farewell, and have yourselves a wonderful Wednesday. <laughs>